Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this night, Lord. Thank you for these fellas that um, have decided to, to come here tonight and spend a little time in, in your word, Lord. So we just um, bless their time and give them safety and travels going home. Lord, I was reminded of, of even, you know, just traveling safely being a blessing, God, on the way to work today. I saw what looked like a pretty nasty accident on, on the interstate, God, and I was thankful, Lord. So pray for them and just reminds me, Lord, that... Uh, we just need your, we just need your guiding hands and your safety always. Um, so Lord, uh, again, just um, speak to them, God. Um, I spent a lot of time on, on this, God. I don't say that in a in any way other than I put time in. But Lord, if, if what I had was just garbage, God, give them something. Give me something else, Lord. Let me another direction or whatever, God, because um, I want them to to get something from you, not from me. So um, again, and that wasn't in a in a self-gratifying way at all. Matter of fact, or just just um, be with this teaching, God. Um, give us all something as we as we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. So really, I did pray that because, as you guys know that have been here before, this is not one of my favorite times. Um, matter of fact, I saw Sean on Sunday, and I tried to pass the cup to him, and he said it was too bitter. Um, <laughs> actually, he didn't. Um, he probably would have taken it, but, um, you know, it was a couple of days away, and, and that just wasn't fun. And I had already spent a lot of time on, on having something, and, and uh, uh, it's kind of weird. This chapter, when I first looked at it, I was like, wow, it's just a bunch of names. How the heck am I going to do anything with that? Um, but in reading and studying and stuff, um, I found 30 pages. So there's actually lots of things to say. So um, it's large font. Um, as I prayed, maybe we'll skip large chunks. I don't know. Maybe they'll ask me back next week. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. All right, so we, we pick it up uh, this week. It's, it's Nehemiah 7, verses 1 through 73. Verse 1. Then it was when the wall was built, I uh, built and I, <clears throat> and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So in reading, you know, we went through Ezra, we've gone through Nehemiah now, and we know that by God's design, um, Zerubbabel and Ezra went back and they built the temple, so there's people here already, and now through God's design, uh, through basically a, um, a pagan king, has sent Nehemiah back, and Nehemiah is going to be tasked with building this, the city. So he's going to be leading the city and has actually led the city um, in rebuilding the walls in the city and ultimately their lives in the community. And we also have learned that he did this in 52 days, which is pretty impressive. Um, and it speaks to me when I think about, wow, you build uh, uh, walls that quickly in 52 days. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good example of how we should do our work, right? And in Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord, <coughs> the Lord Christ. So they may have all thought they were helping Nehemiah build a wall, and ultimately they were doing something that God had called them all to do, um, and they were all getting the blessings, even if they didn't get blessings in heaven for doing that. They put a wall around the city. They were now going to be protected. And given where they were living with no walls, they, they had, had had no protection for a long time, the remnant that had been there and stayed there uh, and, and, gone, and gone back there. And then we see uh, the words, then it was when the wall was built. Um, what this is to me is indicating that we're about to see a shift of priorities, work, responsibilities, and there's going to be some delegation of leadership. Um, they all had a task, they finished their task, and now they're going to start going about living, you know, living their new life, for lack of terms. For some, it was going to be an opportunity uh, for a larger and more important leadership, and while others were just going to have an opportunity of new jobs and tasks. In verse 2, we see that all the leaders are appointed or chosen. Uh, people just didn't raise their hand and say, I'm the leader. Um, Nehemiah was helping select them, um, and I think that's appropriate, so we get the, the right people um, right people there. 
So in verse 1, we see gatekeepers, singers, and the Levites appointed. So let's talk about the gatekeepers. Um, What were they there for? Without the gatekeepers, your city might have a wall, but if your gate's always open, if it's not, if it's not protected, um, you've got no real safety for the city. People can still come in. Um, the gatekeepers uh, were responsible for keeping the uninvited guests out. Um, you know, at some point, they would open the doors or open the gates. You want somebody there that says, you're allowed, you're not allowed, and you're allowed, because uh, you just don't want anybody wandering around your city you know what they're going to be doing. I was thinking about this. I was reminded of, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce his name right, but Hemdall and Thor, right? If you remember him, he was responsible for the Rainbow Bridge, which is basically a doorway into Asgard. Um, and his job was basically to allow entrance out and allow entrance in, and no unauthorized beings could come in on his watch. That's what the, the plan was. And then I also thought it was interesting as he opened it, or he had a sword that he was using. Um, and he wasn't just sitting there in street clothes, right? He was arrayed for battle. If somebody got in, he had his sword, he had his helmet, he was ready to do battle. And it made me think if we're going to be effective gatekeepers, we need to gear up prepared for battle as well. Ephesians 6 11 says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil So what are these weapons? Ephesians 6 14 through 17 stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace of all all things taking the shield of faith <clears throat> which with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So clearly one of the weapons is the word of God. Gatekeepers are to do what? We're to be vigilant. And if you're not staying vigilant um, and staying in the word, you won't be ready for battles as they, as they come your way. <clears throat> and as we know, um, we have an enemy that wants to come against us, right? First Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Um, that's part of the reason for gatekeeper, right? We don't want that lion to come in. So uh, as leaders of families, as leaders in church, you know, we're to be the, the gatekeepers there. And if you've got a family especially, I mean, protect your, your little ones, protect your wife. Um, how do we do that? Washing with the word, right? Um, praying over them. And then we go to the singers, right? Um, without singers, there could be no focus on worship. That was their job. So, and I, I think if singers were appointed here, I think it's safe to assume that uh, worship is being deemed important. Um, one of the reasons why I think it's important, right, sometimes you're having a bad day. Um, you start singing a song, you may come in here, you know, church on Sunday, and it's, eh, eh, eh. You get in there and you start rocking it out with the worship team. Before you know it, you're singing a new song, right? That's pretty cool. So I, I think that, that the selection of singers here is, is saying this is important. This can help get your heart and your mind right and put it in a place where you can actually hear from, hear from God. And we'll talk about how they heard from God again here shortly. So the other thing they were doing right with, with singing too, they were going to maintain and encourage an attitude of, of worship. So we too should worship, you know, and I was asking myself, and you should too, are you a good worshiper? Not just in there, um, you know, when you're walking the streets, you know, you're humming, humming tunes and, and, you know, even our work, right? And they're not talking about this here, they're talking about singing, but even our work is, is worship, what we do with our hands and feet, you know, that, that's worship too, where you a grumbler. I'm doing this for God, you know, kind of thing. That's not, that's not worship. It's, it's a hard thing. And if we look at David, right, who was known as a man after God's own heart, you look at Psalms, right? What is most of that? It's songs, a lot of it. He starts out, you know, not in good shape, and then he reads a little bit longer, and he's even at a, at a much better place. So then we have the Levites. <coughs> 
And without the Levites, the priests would be overwhelmed and unable to make offerings and sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. And the community was about to explode with people coming in. I mean, they already had a lot, but they were about to get more. Um, and so the priests, they needed to, they needed to be focused on um, sacrificing and intercession, mediation between God and man. That was their, that was their job. And without the Levites doing some of the heavy lifting, if you will, um, who's going to do the other job? We're all called to acts of service and not everything that each of us do is the same thing, thank goodness. Um, you know, I look at a couple builders in here, you guys don't want me on your team, right? But I can do other things. So, um, so the Levites would, would do things like preparing sacrifices, they would do cleaning of the temple. They would make repairs. Um, on some levels, they were, they were kind of deacons, if you will. But they would also, these guys did a lot. So we're going to go through the list. They were musicians and singers and doorkeepers. And we won't read this, but it's numbers uh, 1, 50 through 53, 3, 6 through 9, 4, 1 through 33, and First Chronicles 23 talk about them doing all of those different things. They were also responsible for teaching the people. Deuteronomy 24, 8, 33, 10 through 11, and, and other ones. Why would teaching the people be important? Uh, people need God, right? They need to hear the word of God. People need to be reconciled to God. That was one of their main priorities, right? They were, they were responsible for, for teaching. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 20 um, kind of puts us, or reminds us that we're in a similar place in what we need to do with the word. It says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. When we share God's word, we can rely on the truths found in Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So while we each may not be called to teach in a traditional sense, teaching is discipling, right? I mean, that's, I mean, it can be standing up on a stage and being an evangelist. It could be being a missionary. It could be just coming along a brother who might be younger than you, not just in age, but, but more importantly, younger in their walk with God and taking them alongside and helping them and instructing them. You know, we look at Paul and Timothy, right? Um, so it, it, it speaks to that as well. So we should be asking God and looking for opportunities to tell others about him, and thus fulfilling the great commission spoken of in Matthew 28, 10. Go, there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's part of a commandment given to us. What are we doing with it? So... Again, we may not all be able to teach, but we sure as heck should be able to find a brother that's not in a similar place as we are and help them walk it out. So Levites were also scribes, Second Chronicles 34, 13. So they did a lot of writing, a lot of writer's cramp. So, and then I find in a lot of places, Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 9, 21, 5, 1 Chronicles 23, 4, etc., etc., that they were also judges. So they were appointed the nation's judges. This was one of the last things that I saw, uh, or then I also saw um, that they were uh, responsible for accurate weights and measures. Um, clearly, their job was pretty important. You know, we just talked about, well, they just support the priests. Well, they do a lot more than just support the priests. Uh, given that, I think it's pretty clear that you're gonna wanna pick those people and not just let somebody say, I think I'll be a Levite. Um, are they going to do all of these things? And even if they're going to do all these things, they're going to be faithful to them, and are they going to do them well? Uh, if they're choosing themselves, probably not. Um, one of the things I was thinking, too, is I thought about all the different things that, that they do. Um, they kind of acted like a, a de facto government for Israel. Um, and so what, what do we do with that, right? And at the end of the day, God allows governments to be in place 
um, and they play heavily into what a given community is allowed to do and how they run. And so it reminded me, how do we, how do we choose our elected officials? I don't think God plays political parties. We shouldn't either. Right? And I think what we do, you look at people, hear their story, hear their word, find who mostly aligns with scripture, there's your candidate. Doesn't matter which side of the aisle he's on, or she's on. Um, if they align with scripture, that's your, that should be your pick. Um, that was an opinion, so you do with it what you want, right? So, um, you know, because some people it's like, well, who's, well, anyway. Um, if nothing else, I think we can see by their, by this, that they were involved in, in community, um, and we're to be involved in community as well. God's in control, true. But he doesn't say, well, since I'm in control, go do what you want. Don't be engaged. Don't have anything to do with this. We're still not excused from those things that he's given us to be responsible with. And I think being involved in government in our country, which is a blessing, a lot of places you go, toe the line, man. Here, at least we still have some opportunity, so we should take advantage of that where we can. So off that little soapbox. I didn't mean it to be a soapbox, but anyway. Um, in verse 2, we see two people talked about, Hananiah and Hananiah, that they were going to be given charge over Israel. Um, up until this point, Nehemiah was the man, right? He was responsible for going back, uh, getting the people together, starting to build the wall, making sure everything ran well. If they, there was conflict, he was helping out that. If there were people saying, ah, we want you to do this, we want to help, he was responsible for saying, we're not going to let you. Um, but now he's, he's kind of turning over the reins. And it reminds me that, that Christ-like leadership delegates and shares the burden of ministry. Um, some of the reasons for that should be just readily apparent. If you put everything on your back at some point, you're going to struggle um, and you're going to fall. So find, find good brothers to, to, share the, to share the load. Um, and I was reminded of, of the story of Moses, right, when he picked judges. His father-in-law saw what he was doing, judging all the people. He's like, good grief, dude. How are you going to handle all this? Um, there's a better way. And so if you look, in, and we'll pick it up in Exodus 18, 23, and then I'll skip and do 25. It says, if you do, these thing, if you do this thing and the Lord commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all the people will also go to their place in peace. So the first thing I'm thinking I thought of when I was reading this is, um, not only is it a burden for him, but... If he's doing all the judges, there's got to be a line thousands and thousands of uh, uh, deep. So if you've waited in line for 95 hours to get your opportunity to say somebody stole my camel, um, you're probably not going to go back to your home in peace, especially if you lose the case. So Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of 50, and rulers of 10. I don't think he took the the best leaders, the oldest leaders, and said, I'm going to let you rule over 10, and took the infants, if you will, and said over hundreds and thousands. I, that was probably chosen by who's got the experience, who can carry the load, and you know, people probably moved up the, up the ranks over time. Um, he just wasn't going to give people responsibility of, uh, I pick you, and, and you're responsible for a thousand. Let's wait and see how that goes. That's just conjecture, um, but I think it makes it makes sense. And so back to these two men, right, Hananiah and Hananiah, why were they, why were they picked specifically and maybe even called out? Um, they were faithful, right, and they feared God, and it says they feared, uh, at least from, from Hananiah's uh, point of view, um, feared God more than many. And then Hananiah, as, as we recall from the beginning of the chapter, is actually Nehemiah's brother, and he was um, helpful because he had gone back to Jerusalem, come back with a report. So he was faithful to come back with a report so Nehemiah could say, yeah, this is what I need to pray about, what we need to do. So he had probably already proved his faithfulness just by virtue of being his brother for a long time and says, okay, I, I can trust you. And then I kind of noticed in here, you know, things are in scripture or not in scripture, I think sometimes for a reason. And notice it didn't say he picked the smartest, he picked the best looking, the ones with the most hair, 
um, you know, uh, or the most talented, right? That's not how he, he selected it. While I'm sure that those two fellows weren't adults, um, he, they were primarily chosen because of a track record of being faithful and having demonstrated a healthy fear of God. We kind of talk about, you know, deacons and elders here and, and how they're selected, right? People are, are watched, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a you know, a, a, an evil, in an evil sense, right? And like we've got cameras, right? But you're watched, and are you faithful in the things that you do currently? What, what are you walking in? And, and a lot of times it said, that person's walking as a deacon, let's make that person a deacon. That person's walking in an el as an elder or demonstrates that they should be or whatever, and they're selected. Again, it's just not, I think I want to be an elder or a deacon. So uh, that's not how that goes. So when someone thinks of you, right, what are they, what are they thinking? They consider you faithful? And then what are you faithful to? Are you faithful to yourself? Um, I have to have this, I have to have that, you know, I got to make sure my needs are taken care of, you know, and you're, you're faithful in that kind of sense. Are you faithful to your family? Are you faithful to God? Are you faithful in some ministry? What about your finances with your work? You know, we're supposed to, you know, work, and if you're being paid for 40 hours, are you working 40 hours? Are you like, well, I'm working 36, but I want 40, and you know, some people, you know, work more than that, but point is, you know, be faithful, be faithful at your job as well, and it might be I don't say it's not important to be faithful everywhere, but at work, it's really important, right? Because people are watching you there, and you're like, yeah, I went to church on Sunday, and then they, they see you talking in the break room for four hours about something. How is that looking for you? Not good. This gets back, so uh, Proverbs 26, you know, if you're asking yourself that question, you know, what do you think of yourself? Be careful, because most men, it says in verse 9, will proclaim each other, will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? So people say they're faithful, but then when other people, God looks around, it's like, hey, I'm faithful, and God's like, you know, kind of looking over you, because really you're not, you're puffed up. You're thinking you are something that you're not. So honestly ask yourself, am I a faithful person, and to what? Um, and if you can't trust yourself, say, Lord, let me see me for who I really am, right? Because he knows even the, the thoughts in our heart better than we do. If we fear God and are faithful, he very well might grant us opportunities of leadership. It's not a guarantee, um, but, you know, you're faithful, you're going to have that opportunity potentially. So Henry Blackaby um, who I like to read, says, a good leader will move God's people into God's agenda. So the important thing is um, we're moving people into God's agenda, right? If we lack a healthy fear of God, we may be uh, tempted to lead people into what? My agenda, your agenda. And your agenda, my agenda may be great, but if it's, got a, if it's not God's agenda, it's not a good agenda. So if you want some leadership assignments or responsibilities, start being faithful in the little things. This is why I need a computer. I could just swipe left or swipe right. <clears throat> Verse 3. When we get to the names, it'll go fast. <clears throat> and I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors, and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station, and another in the front of his own house. So again, like I mentioned in the beginning, what are the gates closed for? For protection. Um, not necessarily keep people from going out, but keeping bad things, bad people, um, bad influences from coming in. Nehemiah was making it clear that we should, that we should, they should take an active role in keep them, keeping themselves safe. That's in part why they would have gone through all the trouble to build a wall. You build a wall, no gate, why have a wall? And then I don't think, and I, I, I was going to try to run this down a little bit, a little bit more, and I didn't get there. But you know, it mentions at, at a watch station, and then at your house, and it makes me wonder. You know, you're supposed to watch at work, it kind of as a job or whatever. But then it talks about specifically watch your own home. 
um, especially if, if we're men and have families, um, you're responsible for protecting that house. And it just doesn't mean the physical house. Matter of fact, if you've got a family inside, take the house. Everybody inside there, you want to you want to protect them. So, matter of fact, if somebody came in, you could protect, send them out the back, right? And they can take you, they can take the house, but you want your family to escape. So, um, but I, I found it kind of interesting that they were told these are the two places that you uh, should be responsible for watching. Verse four. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not yet built. Were not built. So I'd seen it estimated that when they had finished building this wall that it might hold up to about 500,000 people. And at this time, you know, if you look at the numbers, there was, there was maybe 50,000 that had come back with Zerubbabel and Ezra. Um, but if you look at those numbers, because um, a lot of folks decided not to come back um, and live in Jerusalem. So maybe, maybe 2% had come back, and uh, the reason for that is is um, couple. You know, people didn't want to come back from Babylon to Jerusalem. Maybe they didn't want to identify with God anymore. Um, maybe they were a part of a community and had been grafted in in a bad way to Babylon and what Babylon had to offer and the worldly comforts in that system. Um, just like those that were in Babylon in captivity. They had a choice. Do they stay or do they leave? A lot of them stayed and some of them came back. Not everybody's going to be, uh, not everybody's going to choose to be a part of the family of God. And even if you've chose to be a part of the family of God, you may not choose to be an active participant in that family. So when these folks stayed in Babylon, you know, I was thinking that, that, you know, they lost, they lost their opportunity and you know, especially if they became part of the world, lost their opportunity to be salt and light. And they were pulled and set apart for, the Jews were for a lot of reasons. One of them was, this is what a community and a people look like that are relying on God, trust God, believe in God, and they're supposed to be different. If you're in Babylon and you're just like everybody else, you're no longer any different. And again, you've lost your salt and light. We as Christians, we're called to very similar tasks. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, <clears throat> how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we want them to see, not so they can, good job, Jim, good job, put your name in the box, but you can reflect, right? Um, I did a good job and there's a reason, right? I'm, I'm doing it not for you, for, for God. <coughs> you wouldn't light a lamp for light and then Take it and put a basket on it, what good is it? And then later in uh, Nehemiah 11, 1 through 2, um, when we get back to the fact that there weren't many people in the city, we're going to see that they're going to um, they're going to um, they're going to cast lots. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later too. And they were going to start choosing people uh, with lots to come back and populate the city as well. I was thinking they were trying to populate the city and there's going to be a new Jerusalem one day and it needs to be populated. <clears throat> what are we doing to help populate it, right? We're called to, to share Jesus because um, we, we want to help populate the city. And I was thinking, too, as people would come into the city, we'll see later they were building houses as people would come in. And it reminded me of another... A uh, verse in John 14 2 um, where he's gone where Jesus is gone um, says in my father's house are many mansions I won't read the rest of the thing but he's going to, to build houses for us um, <laughs> and it reminded me of you know I don't know how much 
uh, time you guys spend watching Oprah. I don't spend any time watching Oprah, but I've, I've seen enough things where at the end she says, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. And I was reminded, you get a home, you get a home, you get a home. So as people are introduced to Jesus, they get a home. And I, I just had that thought in my head and thought it was kind of funny. So um, squirrel moment. Verse 5. Then my God put in my, into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people, that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. So I'm going to stop there for a second because we're not going to read who's written in it because that starts in verse 6. Um, but the Nehemiah here was the cupbearer and the one that's talking. Um, and at this time he was uh, the governor of Judah and over, you know, as we had talked about, over the wall building. I only mention that because in verse 7 we talk about a Nehemiah and if you don't pay attention, you're like, how is he there and there as well as this second trip? It's a different fella. With respect to the counting on its own. Notice he didn't say, I figured I would count. I think it would be a good idea if I took a count. I want to know how many people I put in the city. Who did I hook up? How many, how many people did I take care of? No, he's saying, God put it in my heart. So when I read that, I was thinking, well, that's cool. He's going to do something God's told him to do. So what are the other times when people decided that it might be a good idea to count? Numbers 1 through 2 with verse 1 abbreviated, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness. Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male individually. So, good idea. God said count. Guess what you do? You count. Then we look at 1 Chronicles 21, 1 through 2, and then the same story in 2 Samuel 24, 1 through 2, and it says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the leaders of the people, go number Israel. Hmm, doesn't sound like this is going to work out too well. And if you know that story, ultimately what happened? The Lord, you know, he got to, David got to choose punishment, if you will, and the Lord said, okay, I'll take care of it, send a plague, 70,000 dead. So not only did it not work out for David, I don't think it worked out for Israel either. If, if, um, but having said that, it was, it was a merciful punishment because they could have just been absolutely wiped out for the disobedience. And then um, maybe the most important one that we all know is in Luke 2, where you see Joseph and Mary. They left uh, Galilee um, to go to Bethlehem because Jesus, Ju, uh, Joseph was of the house and the lineage of David, so he needed to register. Why was this important? Well, if you remember in Micah 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. So this other one where a pagan government is saying, I want your money, out of that, God uses it to fulfill ultimately scripture because Mary and Joseph have to go there because he has to pay taxes or he's in trouble, and they, that's where Jesus was born. So with Nehemiah, um, because he was willing to be led, I think God put, his, put things in his heart. Um, I think God knows if we're not willing to be led, why bother, right? Uh, I'm just going to tell you, um, and you're not going to do anything with it. And transparency here... Um, I had an opportunity, and I don't remember trying to think of where it was. Oh, it was here at church on Sunday. I was talking to somebody, and they started talking about something, and um, I was like, I need to pray for them. And I let them walk off, and it's been bugging me ever since, right? And what I don't want to have happen is I ignore that enough because I do want to be led, but if I ignore it enough, am I going to... Am I going to be encouraged to do that anymore? Well, I still hear God say, you know what? Pray for that person. So um, be careful, right? So not only do you want to be led, yes, but if you're led, do something with it. Don't just ignore it. So transparency, I was a bad boy on Sunday. I asked for God to forgive me, and if I can see them on Sunday, I'm going to hook them up. If not, for, <laughs> if not for them, for me. So, and Carson and I have had that discussion before, 
and I think I've said it on one of the teachings, um, when we started working, I didn't know him, but I felt God telling me to pray for him. And I was like, not going to do it. I don't know him. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. So I actually found him, and I said, dude, you got to let me pray for you. God's killing me. So I, we prayed, and it was awesome. God left me alone in a good way because I took care of business. So um, you, want, you want to be used like that. And again, if you, know, you, you, you don't want to quench that spirit. So the other thing, too, is, you know, he's, again, he's doing this led by God. Be careful not to blaze your own trail. Um, it may not be, it may not always be the best road. And then if you're going to do something, um, and even if it's a good thing, right, and it's not in his will, there's a chance you got a problem. So question your your thought process. Why are you why are you doing this? Are you doing this so people are like, hey, look, he's she's whatever. Um, and even if it's a good thing, right? Um, you want you want to be led by God. Period. In the story. Um, I remember. Uh, they're not here, so I think I can say this. So there was a person that used to go here, and they used to talk about, you know. I don't even want to go to lunch without praying, and then I want to know what God wants me to eat. And there was a part of me that's like, oh, really? Right? Really? Um, and I didn't say anything to them, because I'm like, that's, I'm sure that's my fault, my problem. I probably should be asking God, okay, you steer the car, right? Take me to, but please, God, take me to Burger King, because I like a Whopper, right? But, um, but in reality, and I, I, I it might have been, DA, I can't remember who, but somebody has told, you know, stories, and you guys may have these too, where God's like, eat at such and such a place, or go do such and such, and it's like, this is really a, sm a small thing, Lowe's versus Home Depot, right, who cares, I need a hammer, um, but he may want you at Home Depot, and I'm looking at Carson, you know, Carson's got to pray at Home Depot, you know, so he's got to go to Home Depot, so anyway, it's important, right, so, you know, I'm, and I'm, when I'm saying that, I'm questioning. I wasn't really making fun so clear. I wasn't like, come on, brother. You're, what are you? It's, it wasn't. I was actually thinking to myself, again, wow, maybe I should be that sensitive to, to things. Um, I mean, heck, when we're driving in the car with our wife, right, it's where do you want to go? No, where do you want to go? No, where do, where, where do you want to go, right? So we're having an active conversation with our wife about where to go. If God's our friend and we're supposed to be, you know, his co-pilot, right, um, and we're talking, why isn't where you're going for dinner important? So, I didn't mean to get off on a little sidebar, but um, anyway, but as it turns out, right, we see that, um, that when, he, when Nehemiah was going to go register, he found that they had already done that way back, so he was just, I'll grab it off the shelf and I'm going to run with this. Um, that might probably is an indication that what he was doing, because now he was just going to get to review instead of counting. I think that was kind of an indication, right call. You were supposed to count, but I'll, I'll make it easy on you. Here's, here, you don't need to do the legwork. I've already got it for you. Verse 6, these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away from Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and, carried, and, and had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city. So everyone to a city, it speaks to the reality that not everybody came back to Jerusalem. I mentioned this a little bit ago where they had a bunch of people come back, but not everybody showed up. So the, the place was sparsely populated. And I think it helps to explain some of the lack of, of numbers of bodies in verse 4. Um, some of them, again, had returned elsewhere. And if you recall different times, right, they all didn't get their inheritance. They didn't say, hey, your inheritance, every one of you is in Jerusalem, right? They got to go to different places. Um, so many of the Jews had gone back to the places where they had actually got their initial inheritances, which were outside the city limits. Um, you know, thinking about this, it should make it clear, um, you know, who wouldn't want to live in Jerusalem, right? It's Jerusalem. But that's not where you're supposed to be. You don't want to be in Jerusalem, right? You want to go where God wants you, and you want to stay where God wants you to stay. Because um, only in that spot at that time, it will, will you be fully blessed? So God didn't give him an inheritance and then say, you know what, ignore it. 
um, just do something else. He said, I gave you something, it's yours, and he allowed him to go back to it. Verse 7, those who came with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramiah, Nehemani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, Big, Big Vi, um, Nahum, or Nehum, and Bana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. You guys, and I probably knew this before, um, but I started like Zerubbabel. Hmm. He came back. Where have I seen his name before? And yes, this Zerubbabel is the one that uh, was part of the lineage of, of David and ultimately in the line of, 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 of Jesus. So we had, um, he was you know, in the line of Joseph through King David and also in Mary through David's son, Nathan. And so I mention that because, it's, and I'll do it again later, but it's interesting looking at these names. You know, you look at all these names and it's like, it's just a bunch of names. And then when you, if you have time and pick them out and you can follow them along, I'm not saying every name is something you can find something cool about, but there is something in, in that list of names. It's not just there for fun. Um, and, and again, when you think about Zerubbabel, he's there and you can find and trace his lineage all the way to the birth of Jesus. And that makes this list, even if you read it on its own and knew that, it makes this list kind of cool. Even if the other names turn up nothing. And if you want to see the, uh, the list, it's in Matthew 1 and he's in verse 12 and then also in Luke 3 and he's listed in verse um, 27. And uh, what I wrote here is Zerubbabel really was in his, part of his story, and it's in all caps, because it's the story of Jesus. Verse 8 through 38, these are the people that were registered after the return from captivity. These are just uh, kind of the rank and file folks. Um, there's also, you know, the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, kind of, you know, I don't want to say parallel, but similar, different times, uh, but, but, but same listings and things. So Ezra 2, 1 through 35. The sons of Parosh, 2,172. Sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Era, 652. The sons of Pehath Moab, the sons of Joshua, Joab, 2,818. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 800. And 45, the sons of Zach, Zachai, um, 760, sons of Benui, 648, the sons of Bebai, 628, the sons of Asgad, uh, 200 or 2,322, the sons of Donicum, 667, the sons of Bigvi, 2,067, the sons of Aden. 655, the sons of Adder, of Hezekiah, 98, the sons of Hashem, 380, 328, the sons of Bezai, 324, the sons of Haref, 112, the sons of Gibeon, 95, the men of Bethlehem and Nedapha, 188, the sons of Anathoth, 128, the men of Beth, Asmaveth, 42, the men of Kirjath, Jerem, Chephariah, Baroth, 745. They relocated to Kernersville. They have a tire store right around the corner. The men of Ramah and Gibba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nebo, 52. The, son of, the sons of the other Elam, 1,254. I don't know what happened to the other Elam. Um, the sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721. Um, the sons of Zena, uh, 300. Nine, uh, 3,930. I don't know if you can tell, but I've been practicing those names for a long time. Verse 
verses 39 through 42, these are going to be the priests that were registered on the return from captivity. And again, their counterpart in Scripture, Ezra 2, 36 through 39. The priests, the sons of Jedidiah, of the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emmer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,245. The sons of Haram, 1,017. Verses 43 through 45 are the Levites. And remember earlier we talked about them and all their responsibilities. That's the same group. They're also found in Ezra 2, 40 through 42. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua, of Kadmiel, and the sons of Hodava, 74. The singers, the sons of Aspa, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom. The sons of Adar, the sons of Talon, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hadai, the sons of Shobai, 138. And just, I said, it's the same um, this is the people that we talked about earlier. This are Levites registered in the first return, not necessarily the same Levites that, that got appointed because in the, uh, Nehemiah 1 and 2, that was they were appointing new folks. Verses 46 through 56 are the Nethanims. Um, they were uh, temple servants um, registered after the return from captivity. They also can be found in Ezra 2, 43 through 54. Before we read just, uh, just another list of names, I want to talk about them for a minute. A um, little bit of conjecture, but I think if you look at the scripture, you can make argument that, that this is the case. But uh, as we said, that um, they would have been the temple servant, servants, and they carried water and wood for the temple. So uh, 392 were bought back with Zerubbabel. We see that here in verse 60. Um, then also in Ezra 2, uh, 58, and then we see another group mentioned, 220 of them uh, that returned with Ezra and Nehemiah 11, 21, and also mentioned in 8, 20. So who are these people? And this is, the, again, the conjecture. There's some thought that these are descendants of the Gibeonites that we find in Joshua 9. Um, not going to read the entire chapter, but uh, basically the, you know, as, as Joshua was just destroying everything in Jordan, um, the inhabitants of Gibeon, they acted craftily and, and pretended to be ambassadors from a nearby country. And uh, so what did Joshua do? Something he shouldn't have done. He made a covenant with them um, and only to find out that they actually live right next door. So now he's got a problem. He's supposed to destroy everybody there, but he made a covenant, so how can he break his covenant? So in verse 25, this is what we see. And now he this is the, the, the people of Gibeon talking in. And now here we are in your hands. <clears throat> do with us uh, as it seems good and right to, to do to us. And now uh, Joshua. So he did to them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel. Because again, they were supposed to be destroyed. So they didn't kill them. And that day Joshua made them woodcutters and water carriers. Hmm. What was their responsibility? Woodcutting and water carrying. Uh, for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord in the place which he would choose even to this day. So again, conjecture, but I think pretty good conjecture, you know, from, from what, I, what I saw, and I say conjecture because I don't know that anybody can say it's, but, but again, if you follow scripture, I think it's a, a fairly safe bet. Um, so again, kind of as we talked about Zerubbabel, right, it's interesting looking at names, groups of names, and people, um, because you find interesting things about them and maybe reasons why they show up in different places. And if true, if they were part of those that made covenant and were, in essence, cursed to be servants, um, and now we find them, well, why did they get picked for that service? Well, they didn't really get picked. That's kind of a lot that they chose for themselves. Um, so, and then the last thing, right, when we see different things like that, you know, the, the names, the places, um, they no longer seem unnecessary or uninteresting. So now verse 46 of Nehemiah. The Nethanim, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Has Hasupha, the sons of Tab Tabaoth, the sons of Kiros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Padan, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of 
Sammai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gibel, or Giddel, the sons of Gehar, or Gahar, the sons of Riah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazim, the sons of Uzza, the sons of Paziah, or Paziah, the sons of Bazai, the sons of Menum, Meunim, the sons of Nephesh Yesim, um, the sons of Bakbok, the sons of Hakapa, the sons of Harher, Harher, the sons of Baz, Bazlith, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tama, and the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hadaphiah. So I just had a thought in my brain that the Lord might be trying to teach me humility with, with my reading here. As, so anyway, um, verses 57 through 60 are Solomon's servants that were registered. And this same list uh, can be found in Ezra 2.55. Verse 57, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sodai, the sons of Sophrath, the sons of Parada, the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Haddle, the sons of Porcupine, of Porchereth, of Zibam, the sons of Ammon. All the Nephilim, the sons of Solomon's servants, were 392. Verses 61 through 62, these would have been the non-pedigreed people that were registered uh, in captivity. And if you follow the lineages of Jews and stuff, they're pretty, they like to keep up with who knows who and, and who's, who's related to who. Same list again, uh, Ezra 2, 59 through 60. And it's kind of cool, right? I'm listing, you know, a couple of things like here, these lists. I'm giving this list and giving another list. And then, you know, as we look at scripture with other stories, there it is there, and even look at the gospels, right? You could take one gospel and say, well, that's just a story there, but then if you look, it's written several more times, and there, it may have a little bit different angle or a little, you know, the juxtaposition from who's writing, but the facts and everything are the same. So it's kind of cool when you, when you can look at something and, and then go find it in another place. It just adds credence to what we already know, which is the Bible's infallible, it's true, everything in it's true, it's right. Um, but when people are like, well, what about that? There's always other scripture where you can back it up and, you know, it tends to be, right, this was written here, and then 100 years later, it was written again, and you would think, wouldn't it change? And it doesn't, right? So I think there's a reason for that. Jesus is making sure his word doesn't change. Um, verse 61. And these were the ones who came up from Tamala, Telharsha, Cherub, Adam, Emmer, but they could not identify their father's house nor their lineages, lineage, whether they were of Israel. The sons of Deliah, Deliah the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Verses 63 through 65 are the pedigreed priests who were returning um, and could prove their, their lineage. They are found in Ezra 2, 61 through 63 as well. Um, 63 says, And the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Kaz, the sons of Barzali, uh, who took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their names. Squirrel. All right. It's another squirrel moment, right? You read these names. Um, does Barzillai ring a bell to anybody? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, so, so this fellow that's mentioned here, they're descendants of another, of, of, of a fellow named, guess who, Barzelli, and he had assisted David during the time of Absalom's rebellion. There's a verse, 2 Kings 2, 7, that David on his deathbed says this, or, or just said on his deathbed, um, one of his charges to Solomon was show kindness to the son of Barzali the, Gideon, the Gileadite. So not saying David had anything to do with the kindness here, but it's interesting we see a name and then fast forward you see lineage and it just it weaves everything together, which I kind of find interesting. Verse 64, these sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled 
And the governor said to them that they should not eat the most high things till a priest could consult the Unum and the Thuman. So some of the so-called priests couldn't be registered, and so they lost their place in the priesthood. Um, the governor here that we're talking about would have been Zerubbabel. He's mentioned in, you know, the same thing is mentioned in Ezra 2.63. So he's making decisions based on, you know, uh, what's being seen um, there. Um, some of them that claim to be legitimate priests, um, but they just couldn't prove, they couldn't prove their lineage. If you can't prove your lineage, you got a problem with legitimacy. If you got a problem with legitimacy, you can't be a priest. So what does it say? And it says a priest would have to consult with the Unum and the Thuman to determine the legitimacy of these uh, so-called priests, and they would be excluded from priestly rights until their legitimacy could be de determined. So what were some of these rights? Um, one of them was they couldn't eat, and it says it, they couldn't eat the most holy things. One of the way they got their sustenance was um, they got to partake in part of the offering, right? So. Um, they got to have part of the meal offerings, the sin offerings, the right shoulder of the peace offerings. Um, you can find that in Leviticus 2.3, um, 10, 12 through 7, and Numbers 18, 9 through 10. Um, and then, so I don't know, may want to, so what's this Unum and, and Thuman thing? Um, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. But if you look at how, how this was used, they were also, um, these were, there was some conjecture that it was precious stones that the priest, the high priest would have carried over his breastplate. And they would take them out. And, you know, one thing I read said, you know, maybe they had yes and no written on them. I'm not so sure they would have had yes and no written on them. But, they would ask God something and they would look at these stones or whatever they were and that's where they would, that's where they would get their answers um, sometimes. So if we see Deuteronomy 33, eight, you know, the advice given to, uh, given to Levi is make sure that this is always with the high priest for times of crisis, so they could go to these things. And I just skipped about a page, but some of the definitions and the attributes and the things you read about those, those things and how they were used, the answers were coming to the high priest from God through the Uman and Thurman, uh, Thuman as instruments of his word, for lack of terms. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a, in a second too. Um, but some of the times that this was used, um, or these were used when Joshua was leading Israel into Canaan in Numbers 27, 18 through 24. He was also dealing with Achan, Joshua 7, 14 through 18. Um, then when he was dividing the land for the tribes, Numbers 34, 17 and Joshua 17, 4. Saul also, King Saul also used them in 1 Samuel 28, 6. Um, and it worked for him sometimes, but in this verse, he had a sin issue. They didn't work for him. And it reminded me, when I, again, thinking of how these were used and kind of what they did and how people took them seriously, we get sin in our life, guess what? Our prayers, too, are hindered. And, and that's that, that, the, the, the tool of, of Saul with the Uma uh, uh, and Urim, Urim and Thuman here um, was, was, torn, was, was taken away because of his sin. Um, so again, as I mentioned, uh, the, the method of, of using these two is also referred to as casting lots because um, it was done a different way, but there's lots of scripture. If you look for lots, and I won't list them, but there's lots of scriptures where lots were used. Um, some phrases such as came up, came forth, came out are used conjunction in conjunction with casting of lots. One interesting thing is when they would use these, that complete satisfaction and reliance on the decisions demonstrated by these um, instruments, the uh, Urim and Thummim through the high priest, um, if they said yes, they said no, it's, it was 
it was over. Proverbs 18, 18 said, casting lots causes contention to seep and keeps the mighty apart. And then in Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from God. So uh, decisions made through them were always com considered the will of God. And given that they were the high priest, he was acting as mediator on God's behalf. So out of all that, and again, we skipped a lot, but it just made me kind of happy that I don't have to go find somebody that has this urim and thummim and say, I've got a question, can you give me an answer, right? Um, we don't need those. We don't need a high priest. Instead, we can go directly uh, to God through Jesus because he is our high priest in Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, uh, let your request be made known to God. It doesn't say um, be made known to God through a priest, right? I think that's kind of cool. And then in Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, um, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Um, kind of cool, not only are we going to somebody that's not a man, right, in the typical sense of the word, um, we're going to, to, to God, but it's someone who was tempted, never sinned, but was tempted, who felt pain, right? Who didn't have to, because he could have, but, um, but anyway, the, the, whole, the whole thing that I was thinking about, and I think about this when I think of Leviticus and Levitical law and things like that, you know, they had to, you know, if you look at how often they had to sacrifice and how much blood, I'm like, that was a full-time job, you know, and it literally was. And, you know, now we can pray without ceasing, just driving around. It's like, yeah, you know, I want to pray where I want to go to eat. Boom, done, all good. I don't have to stop at a, I don't have to stop somewhere, find a high priest, say, hey, listen, I really need to know where I want to eat. So um, all of that to say, it's, it's really cool that we're living in a time where we can go straight to God with our, with our wants, needs, desires, and ask him for help. Verses 66 through 67, just the totals of the congregation registered. Um, the same list can be found in Ezra 2, 64 and 65. Altogether, the whole assembly was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom 7,337, and they had 245 men and women singers. Verses 68 through 73, um, just a count of the possessions they had, same list, Ezra 2, 66 through 70. Horses were 766, uh, mules 245, camels 435, donkeys 6,720, uh, and some of the heads of the fathers gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 uh, gold drachmas, 50 basins, 530 priestly garments, some of the heads of the fathers gave to the treasury work uh, of, the, of the work, 20,000 gold drachmas, 2,200 silver minas, and that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas, 2,000 silver minas, and 67 priestly garments. In verse 68 through 73, uh, still return, referring to the time as rubble as, as governor, so they were, you know, just kind of paying forward in preparation for things so the city could be taken care of. And they were, um, um, and it's clear why we don't say everyone gave, it just says the people. Um, and then we see different levels of giving. You know, the governor um, would have been, um, you know, we see him called out specifically. He gave a lot more just on his own, probably had a lot more. Um, point is, you know, everybody's represented there. Governor's represented, the people are represented. Just the rank and file are representative, uh, uh, represented. Um, they gave to build because they wanted to be a blessing. There's no difference for us today. Um, what are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our talents? What are we doing with our monetary resources? Um, a kind of a life lesson, you know, if you will, is if you, uh, you can know this, if, if God uses the resources provided by his people to build and further his kingdom, and then kind of going along with that, um, he can do it without us doesn't need our resources. Um, you know, he owns the cattle on the thousand hills, right? You know, that song from when you were young and the verse. Um, but if we don't play our part, 
uh, we lose out on his blessings here and rewards and treasures in heaven later by not taking part in his agenda. We're almost done, guys. So Matthew 6, 19 through 21, you all know this. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your heart is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So this is why I didn't want to kind of skip this part because as I was doing this, um, maybe you know, a thousand people have thought this before me and I never heard it. Um, Jesus died, right, so people could go to heaven. We all know that. Um, I think it's just safe to assume that he thinks people are pretty special because he's willing to lay down his life, right? Matthew 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for ransom for many. So he was willing to give his life up so we could all go to heaven. Um, and this is what I was thinking. When I've always talked about treasure, it's, it's you know, kind of do good works and do things, and you get a crown, and you'll get this, and you'll get that. But aren't people treasure? If you win people to Christ and they're in heaven, you've paid the ultimate forward. Um, I've never looked at that. Maybe a gazillion people have. That just occurred to me as I was studying. And you start thinking about that, you know, it, it's, I'm going to see my grandmother, and if you help put your grandmother there, that's pretty cool. Now my heart's kind of there, right? Because I'm ready to be reunited. You know, it's cool. I get to see Jesus. That's awesome. That's the main thing I want to do, right? And then I want to see these crowns and these other things, but those are ultimately going to be given back. But guess what I get to keep? I get to keep my grandma, right? You get to keep your, your friends if you've sent them forward. And I don't know, maybe, like I said, other people have thought about that before. Maybe you thought about that. But to me, that's, that's kind of the best thing you could send forward, if you will. So, um, so if you're not going to be part of winning people, I wrote in here, so if not, you who? So last verse, so the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the Nephilim, the Nephilim and, all the, and all Israel dwelt in their cities. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel will, were all in their cities. Okay, four more pages. No, I'm just kidding. So, so the cool thing is, right, we're having kind of the closing of the book, right? We see in the, in the you know, they've been doing all this stuff. They're, they're building, building, building. And now we see in the seventh month, they're home. They're in their city. They're in their, their houses. They got a lot more stuff that they got more building and things to do and all that other kind of stuff. But you know, this the story kind of closes. Everything's been rebuilt. So sorry I ran over, fellas, but thank you. <laughs>